Ingenuity, the little Martian helicopter that could, has taken its 72nd and final flight. But don't be upset, because we have yet another Methalox hopper to cover, and, believe it or not, this is what a precise lunar landing looks like. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 26th of January, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. Japan has become the fifth country to softly land a spacecraft on the moon, and, well, despite that, it was still a really wild landing. The spacecraft that accomplished this feat is the Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, or SLIM. SLIM launched all the way back in September of last year and, after a long cruise to lunar orbit, began its descent to the lunar surface on January 19th at 1500 UTC. SLIM's aim was to land very precisely within 100 meters of its landing target. This descent had been carefully planned so that the lander's optical navigation systems could correctly assess where in its path the lander was. And, indeed, the descent proved to be very successful, at least up until its final point. During a nominal situation, the lander would hover for a short time at an altitude of 50 meters to take pictures of the landing site and assess where to land so as to avoid rough terrain that could endanger the spacecraft upon touchdown. This touchdown was also rather unique in that the lander was supposed to cut off its engines a few meters above the ground and use its attitude thrusters to turn into a horizontal orientation, landing on five little legs on the side of the spacecraft. But while the lander was hovering at 50 meters, one of the spacecraft's engines lost thrust. Now, Thankfully, its software was able to adapt to the event and compensate for it as it descended toward the surface. But this also meant that when it was time to cut off the engines and do the flip to horizontal, the vehicle was carrying too much horizontal velocity and it instead ended up basically upside down as it came to a stop. So this meant that the lander's solar panel was now in shadow and therefore it couldn't recharge, cutting the mission short to just under three hours. Now the reason why one of the engines lost thrust during descent was discovered through one of the navigational cameras on the lander. In this image, we can clearly see the nozzle of this engine as it falls down to the surface. Without the nozzle, the engine can still produce thrust, but it's not as efficient, basically producing a lot less thrust. So how did it just fall off? Well, the answer may take a while to figure out, but it is worth noting that this is not the first time that a Japanese spacecraft suddenly lost an engine nozzle. A similar thing happened to the nozzle of the main engine on Akatsuki, where the nozzle just came off during the orbital insertion burn of the spacecraft around Venus. This was later traced back to a jammed valve in between the pressurization system and the fuel tank, which led to an oxidizer-rich combustion on the engine. This caused overheating of the engine's throat and base of the nozzle, which eventually caused it to break off. Now, it's not out of the question that a similar event may have happened here. The notes from the SLIM team indicate that, because of how the spacecraft's propulsion system was engineered, this particular engine, with the failing nozzle, had been burning more oxidizer-rich than the other one all across the mission. All that being said, the lander still demonstrated a precise landing on the moon, despite the attitude it ended up on. The touchdown speed was just 1.4 meters per second, well below its margin of 1.8 to 2.8 meters per second, and the landing occurred 55 meters away from the target landing, which was also well within the 100 meter accuracy that was wanted for SLIM. This accuracy would have actually even been better had the spacecraft's obstacle detection system not carried it to a safer location for the spacecraft's touchdown. Prior to this decision, the lander was well within 10 meters of the target landing location. Another thing that went remarkably well was the deployment of two little rovers named Lunar Excursion Vehicle 1 and 2, or LEV 1 and 2. These were not only deployed, but they also sent back data including the very image that allowed the engineers to assess the attitude in which SLIM was positioned after touchdown. Additionally, the lander was also able to take multi-spectral images of the surfaces before powering down to conserve battery. Now, JAXA hopes that since the spacecraft's solar panel is pointed west, the sun will eventually shine on it and recharge the batteries, enabling the teams a few days of operation on the surface before they need to shut SLIM down again as the lunar night approaches. But even if this doesn't happen, you gotta admit, this mission was quite a success overall. And now from a lunar landing, let's go and take a look at this week in launches. Starting off the week, we had a rare launch from none other than Iran. 
The country's Ka M100 rocket lifted off on January 20th at 628 UTC from the Sharud Space Center. It was carrying the Soraya remote sensing satellite for the country's military. This was the first successful launch of this rocket following an unsuccessful attempt back in March of 2023, although it hasn't been confirmed whether other attempts have been made between then and now. After that launch, we had the third flight of the Li Jian 1 rocket from China. Liftoff took place on January 23rd at 4.03 UTC from Site 130 at the Zhou Chen Satellite Launch Center. The rocket was carrying five Taijing spatial observation satellites manufactured by Minospace into a sun-synchronous orbit. And finally, after several delays, we had the launch of SpaceX's Starlink Group 711 mission. Liftoff took place on January 24th at 35 minutes past midnight UTC from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. The Falcon 9 was carrying 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. This has now brought the total number of Starlink satellites launched up to 5,761. Of these, 387 have re-entered, and 4,659 are now in their operational orbit. The first stage flown on this mission, B-1063, was flying for a 16th time, and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. But we didn't just have all those launches this week, we also had a hop of Landspace's Zuke 3 hopper. The company calls this the VTVL-1 test vehicle, where VTVL stands for Vertical Takeoff, Vertical Landing, and it's aimed at testing the landing technologies that the company will implement on its upcoming Zuke 3 rocket. The hopper sports a single TQ-12 Methalox engine, the same engine flying on Zuke 2, and it also has fixed landing legs attached to it. If we were to compare it to other hoppers, this would be very similar to SpaceX's Grasshopper and Starhopper vehicles. It's also very similar to iSpace's Hyperbola 2 hopper and, well, kind of similar to a lot of other hoppers if you think about it. There's been quite the boom of reusable rocket testing in China, which I guess we're going to have to talk about more in depth in a separate video at some point. But coming back to this hopper in particular, this flight not only tested the propulsion and guidance systems that were needed to softly land Zuka 3's booster back on Earth, but it also tested the stainless steel construction that Zuka 3 is supposed to be made out of. Landspace outsources the manufacturing of this stainless steel construction to RSpace, another Chinese company that focuses on the manufacturing of aerospace components. That means that this flight gives a data point for RSpace to validate the construction of these tanks using stainless steel. While this has been a common manufacturing technique in the U.S. since very early on in rocketry, especially with the early Atlas rocket and all the Centaur upper stages, plus now with Starship jumping in on the stainless steel bandwagon as well, well, China hasn't really done that much in terms of building rockets out of stainless steel. Now, it's important to note that this VTVL-1 vehicle does not represent the full size of the future Zuke 3 booster, as that's planned to be much longer. But it's not out of the question that we may see some sort of VTVL-2 vehicle in the near future that may more closely represent the full size of the upcoming rocket. In the meantime, we'll just have to wait and see what Landspace ends up doing, and as always, we will be here reporting about it as information becomes available. While we may see more flights of the VTVL-1 vehicle, we sadly can't say the same about the topic of this news story. And Guys, I don't think any of us were emotionally prepared for this one. I am of course talking about NASA's Ingenuity helicopter. This week, the agency announced that the helicopter will stop flying after having done so an incredible 72 times due to an issue that occurred on its latest flight. We already had ominous signs of this over the weekend when JPL reported that it had lost contact with Ingenuity after its 72nd flight. Thankfully, the communications were regained a day later, but after carefully downloading pictures from Ingenuity, the engineers discovered that one of the helicopter blades had been damaged. In particular, 25% of the structure of this blade was missing, which effectively means that the helicopter will no longer be able to fly. The engineers are still trying to understand what might have happened for this to occur, including a possibility that the navigation systems were struggling at some point during the helicopter's descent. This 70-second flight was actually a checkout test, where the helicopter was just supposed to fly up, take images of its surroundings, and then come back down so that the teams could understand its exact location based on the photographs that it sent back, since the previous flight had ended prematurely and put Ingenuity in an unknown location. At the same time, teams are also investigating why communication was lost with Perseverance near the end of the helicopter's descent. All that being said, Ingenuity has proven to be quite the remarkable little experiment, and it's proven the possibility of powered aircraft within Mars's thin atmosphere. 
And not only that, but it's also proven that these types of helicopters can effectively serve as scouts for robotic spacecraft, or maybe in the future, even humans. The mission teams were originally only hoping for five successful flights, and instead they got over 14 times that number. All the experience and engineering data gained from this will now be funneled into future missions like Dragonfly, another rotorcraft that's set to fly through the atmosphere of Saturn's moon Titan. So who knows? Maybe this issue with ingenuity has saved some future engineers the pain of having broken rotor blades on Dragonfly or other similar types of vehicles. Even during failure, Ingenuity will be able to provide invaluable insight that would have never been gained without it. Now it is important to point out one other key thing. Ingenuity is not yet dead, it actually still remains active, albeit just immobilized now on the surface of Mars. But with the helicopter unable to fly again, this means it won't be able to accompany Perseverance on its trip around the Red Planet. This in turn also means that JPL will eventually lose contact with the helicopter once Perseverance is out of range, which will render it unable to act as relay. But cheers to an amazing run, little guy. And at least we can be happy knowing that Ingenuity is still there for us to say goodbye, good friend. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. Blue Origin has integrated a new Glenn rocket for the first time. Okay, to be completely fair, this is not a flight vehicle. According to Blue Origin's post on social media, this is a new Glenn test vehicle, but it's helping engineers to exercise mating operations between the first and second stages. It wouldn't be surprising if we see more than this, as the company has filed a communications permit to communicate with New Glenn while on the ground at its launch pad. Perhaps in the coming weeks, Blue Origin teams could integrate the rocket with its transporter erector and move it out to the launch pad for further fit checks and testing. Now I know some of you may be asking, where's the actual hardware for flight? Well for that, you may want to tune in to our next Cape Flyover video releasing next week. You might be surprised. Stoke Space delighted us this week with some fiery footage of its latest engine testing. This test, in particular, was of a development fuel pre-burner for the engine that will power the first stage of the company's Nova rocket. This engine is very similar to SpaceX's Raptor in that it's powered by methane fuel and uses a full-flow staged combustion cycle, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. It's really cool to see Stoke sharing progress of its engine development, and we definitely wish them the best as they continue to push through. This week, the National Reconnaissance Office announced that it has selected Firefly as one of the providers for the office's streamlined launch indefinite delivery program. That program, also nicknamed SLIC because of its initials, is part of the NRO's aim to procure responsive space launch missions from emerging launch providers. This announcement came right on the heels of Firefly's launch of the Victus Knox mission, where the company demonstrated that it was capable of performing a launch on short notice. With this, Alpha will now be able to fly NRO payloads under this program, and Firefly will be able to demonstrate this capability in an actual operational environment rather than as a test. This week we learned some very interesting news. Falcon 9 is set to fly Starlink. Okay, wait, that's a little confusing. What about this? Falcon 9 rockets will be fitted with Starlink antennas to communicate with the constellation of the same name. That's better. Now, you may be wondering, Wait, didn't they do this already? And, well, the answer is no, or at least not directly. We do know that SpaceX uses Starlink antennas on drone ships and that this is mostly why their video signal rarely cuts out as of late. But for Falcon 9 to carry Starlink antennas for communication, well, we would have seen SpaceX request a communications permit for that. And guess what? That's exactly what happened this week. SpaceX filed with the Federal Communications Commission to be allowed to install and use a Starlink antenna on the second stage of the Falcon 9. According to the document, it says, quote, SpaceX intends to demonstrate communications at orbital altitudes on the Falcon 9 second stage after fairing deployment and through stage entry. The document goes a bit more into details on other things, such as the flight profile and use of these antennas, and what it says kind of makes it look like these would be used during Starlink launches. Testing this technology could further improve it, and if it works, SpaceX can get live telemetry and video from that second stage without needing ground stations. It's definitely a win-win situation. This week, the European Space Agency was approved to go ahead with the Envision and LISA science missions, and they're pretty interesting. Envision will be a Venus orbiter that will study the planet in unprecedented detail. Equipped with the latest radar sounding and synthetic aperture radar technologies, the spacecraft will be able to study Venus in far greater detail than any mission prior. 
From studying the surface of Venus to its atmosphere and furthering the understanding of the internal structure of the planet, this is definitely one of the hottest missions that ESA is planning for the next decade. And on the same note, I guess I have to mention that its launch is set to occur no earlier than 2031, so we will have to wait a little bit for this to occur. Now as for LISA, that stands for Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, and it aims to detect and study gravitational waves from space. The mission will see three different spacecraft flying in formation, exchanging laser beams and detecting them with an incredibly high accuracy. Now the idea is that when a gravitational wave passes through the spacecraft trio, it'll alter the paths of the lasers between them, and scientists will be able to use that to characterize the wave that passed by. The distance between spacecraft will be about 2.5 million kilometers, which means they'll be able to capture much larger gravitational waves than the observatories that we have here on Earth. Just like Envision, LISA is planned for launch in the next decade, with a liftoff planned no earlier than 2035. I don't know about you, but I certainly can't wait to see all of these missions going off. Now coming back to something a little closer in time, let's take a look at what's coming up next week in Spaceflight. Virgin Galactic's Galactic 06 mission is set to occur right around the time of publication for this video. So don't fret, we haven't forgotten about it, but we just can't predict the future. But one thing I can totally predict is that we will be featuring this flight on the next week's episode. Electron's launch of four of a kind from New Zealand has now been delayed to January 28th. The flight, set to start within a 45 minute window opening at 6.15 UTC, will feature an Electron booster in reusable configuration and Rocket Lab will attempt its recovery at sea. After that, we'll have a trio of Falcon 9 launches, all potentially within 19 hours. The first of these, Starlink Group 638, is set to take place within a four and a half hour window that opens on January 28th at 2304 UTC. This Starlink mission will be a rare one, as it will take place from Launch Complex 39A instead of happening from Space Launch Complex 40. The second of these three missions, Starlink Group 712, will take place from SpaceX's launch pad at Vandenberg. The four and a half hour window is set to open on January 29th at 210 UTC. And the third mission of this trio will be launching Northrop Grumman Cygnus spacecraft on the NG-20 mission. This will be the first launch of Cygnus on a Falcon 9 rocket, and it's set to take place on January 29th at 1729 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40. Cygnus is then planned to be captured by the ISS robotic arm on January 31st at 2035 UTC. If and this is a big if, all three Falcon 9 launches go on time, SpaceX will break its own record for shortest time between three consecutive missions. The record currently stands at 33 hours and 47 minutes, and it would theoretically go to below 19 hours if these launch dates hold. But of course, that is not always a given. And to close out the week, we may also have the third flight of the Jelong 3 rocket from an offshore launch platform in China. The four-hour launch window is set to open on February 2nd at 2 o'clock UTC. And that's your weekly update of Spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.